Okay, so I'm going to get started again because I know that I am the only thing standing between you and lunch. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about now is JarRefx and actually give you some more detail about what JarRefx, the JarRefx actually is and how you can use it and then I'll give you some examples, some demonstrations of a few things that I've been working on using JarRefx. So to start with, we have the obligatory legal slide, which I have to have on all my presentations, but since you've seen this already, I can move straight past that. So, what is JarRefx? JarRefx is essentially about evolving how we develop client-type applications using Java. So we've, we've heard these phrases, rich internet applications, or rich client platform. Because, as somebody quite rightly pointed out this morning uh, in one of the questions, there is this thing called Flash, which has become very popular. And what that's really done is it, it's shown that Java has become a little bit old and dusty, shall we say, in terms of user interface programming. Because when Java first came out in, way back in 1995, the most exciting thing about Java was the very first demonstration when you had a web page and suddenly you had a little animated Duke logo that moved on a web page. Now that was really hot stuff back in 1995. Clearly, in 2012, having a little animated Duke logo on your web page is not quite so hot stuff. We've moved beyond that. So, Java started out with the idea of adding functionality, adding programmability to web pages, but it never really kind of delivered what people really needed. So Flash became very popular because it was easy to embed media, so you could put videos into web pages. It was easy to, easy to create these interesting looking interfaces where things moved, you had animations, you had different effects. So, what we decided, uh, this was probably about four or five years ago now, was that we needed to update Java to have a, a better way of creating user interfaces. AWT and Swing were fine if you wanted to create a nice grey box-like interface which had buttons and text fields and was sort of forms-based kind of interface. But it was never really going to address the needs of Flash developers. So we decided we would create JavaFX, and when we first came out with this, what we did was we thought, well, let's take a different approach. We'll use the JVM as the, the runtime engine, but then rather than adding APIs and changing the way things work in terms of Java language, we'll create a new scripting language called JavaFX script. So has anybody here tried JavaFX script? Okay, a few people, right. Well. The good thing about JarRefx script was it made certain things quite simple. And so for those of you who tried it, you know, things like binding and so on were quite simple. But the problem was it didn't take advantage of the fact that there's so many people who know how to program in Java. Because it was a new scripting language that looked a bit like ActionScript, a bit like ECMAScript, a bit like JavaScript, but wasn't any of those. So it wasn't quite the same. So when Oracle acquired Sun, we made the decision that actually JavaScript wasn't the right solution. We still wanted to have JarRefx in terms of a way of developing rich user interface applications using Java, but we also wanted to take advantage of the Java language so that developers like yourselves who understand how to program in Java could simply take those skills and then start writing these nice user interface applications. So that's what JarRefx now is. It's a set of APIs that make available from within a Java application the ability to create these types of user interfaces. And so really it is about a modern Java environment. It's about being lightweight, using hardware acceleration, because pretty much every device that you get now has graphics hardware acceleration. So we need to be able to take advantage of that. We need to be able to use that to get the best possible performance. And so that's what we're really talking about. Now, in terms of the, the high-level architecture of how this works, this is 
our usual sort of block diagram with the layers that we have in computer science. Most important thing about this is at the bottom is the Java virtual machine. So at its most fundamental level, you can think of a Java FX application as being just Java. So anything you can do with a piece of Java code in terms of deployment, in terms of how you actually build it and so on, you can do that with Java FX. So we are using the Java runtime, we have access to all of the standard Java class libraries. But then <coughs> what we do is we add some more things on top of that to give us the ability to do interesting things. So the first of those is called Prism, and this is the way that we actually do the rendering onto the screen. This is how we take advantage of the, the hardware acceleration that's available on specific platforms. And the way we do that is that we have different interfaces depending on what platform we're running on. So for example, if you're running on Windows, you're going to use Direct3D because that's the API that's available in Windows to do hardware acceleration. If you're running on Mac, if you're running on Linux, OpenGL will give you the same idea. You can tap into the hardware acceleration. If you happen to have a platform that doesn't have hardware acceleration, and you still want to run JavaFX, that we will support as well. So there's a fallback situation where if you can't find the necessary hardware support underneath, it will drop back to a software implementation and do things using Java 2D. But that won't be really that good in terms of performance. So you're better off uh, using the hardware acceleration that's available, and like I said, most modern platforms, that's not going to be an issue. So that's actually the rendering side of things, how we get the pixels onto the screen. We also have the, the glass windowing toolkit, and that's really about how we interact with the windowing system, if there is one, on the operating system. Because you can run JavaFX outside of a windowing system if you really want to as well. But if you're using Mac, if you're using Windows, if you're using Linux, then you've got a windowing system typically. So we need some way of interacting with the, the way that we can do cut and paste, the way that we can do you know, icons, the way that we can do positioning things on the desktop and so on. So all of those things are handled by the glass windowing toolkit. And then there's a couple of other significant pieces of, of technology that sit on top of the Java virtual machine. One is the idea of the media engine, so that we can actually drive video, we can drive audio from within JavaFX application. I'll talk more about the details of that later on. Similarly, we also have the ability to render web content as part of a JavaFX application. And so we've got a web engine in there based on WebKit, which will allow you to render HTML5 code as part of your application. Again, we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go through. Now, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the sort of significant things that we did fairly recently was to look at how people develop applications, specifically graphical applications. And what you tend to find is that there are different people involved who have different skill sets. There are people who are, like myself, presumably like you, who are developers, who are engineers. Now, I know from experience that I, I think I'm a reasonably good engineer, I think I'm a reasonably good programmer. I'm rubbish at graphics. So when it comes to designing like what looks like a nice graphical interface, I'm pretty bad at that. I end up with like, you know, the wrong colors, the wrong layout, and so on. But there are people who do know about design, and they know how to make, make nice layouts, and use the right colors, and the right look and feel. So what we want to do is to separate that, so that if you have got people who are good at design, and different people who are good at programming, you can allow the designers to work in one way, and allow the programmers to work in another. So to do that, we have a markup language. FXML, which allows you to define the layout, the color schemes, the different things that you're using in terms of the look and feel of your application. And I'll come back into a little bit about uh, this thing called the Scene Builder application, which is designed specifically for those kinds of people. You can drag and drop the buttons, the fields, the layout, the text uh, boxes, all of those types of things, tables, graphs, whatever. Lay them out, adjust color schemes and so on, and then export that as an XML file. You can then import that into a JavaFX application, and all of the components are already available to the programmer. 
programmer then just has to tie those things in in terms of, okay, somebody clicks on a button, what's the actual thing that happens programmatically when that button actually gets clicked? So we're separating out the roles of the two types of people. So Java APIs for programmers, FXML through tools for the graphical designers. Um, talked a bit about this already, but this is really just talking about the, the idea that we have the accelerated graphics pipeline uh, for Prism so that we can use the glass windowing toolkit and, like I say, fallback situation for Java 2D. What it allows us to do is to provide you with a lot of the effects that you need for these kinds of rich applications. And they're the kinds of things that you were not available by default in Swift. <coughs> If you wanted to do more interesting things in Swing, um, there were some very good examples of this that were written by um, Chet Haas and Roman Gee, who used to work for Sun, but have now worked for Google. And they did a, um, a sort of a, a GUI makeover thing where they talked a lot about how you can apply Java to the effect, the Swing components. But the problem with that is, of course, you end up having to subclass pretty much all of the Swing components to add your special effects. So what we do with the idea of the graphics pipeline is to make it very simple to add things like shadows, blurs, um, 2D transformations, and so on to the components in your user interface. So that you don't have to subclass everything. You can simply say, I want this particular part of my interface to have a shadow on it, and it just happens. We're also, as I said, looking at 3D transformations. So we have a sort of pseudo 3D ability at the moment through a perspective transform. And if you can combine those together, then you can make some sort of somewhat 3D looking applications. But we're moving to the idea of full 3D graphics um, at a later date. <coughs> now, one of the things that we are also very aware of is that we want to make sure that JavaFX uh, is both standardized and is open source. So we started off in terms of open sourcing things, so that all the controls, which means buttons, uh, graphs, charts, tables, and so on. All of those are open source. And we're trying to get to the point by the end of the year where everything that is JavaFX will be open source. So there's an open JFX project under the open JDK project, which contains all of the source code that's being um, made available. And I think just literally in the last couple of days, we've pushed a, a bunch of code into that. So there's more available from there now. The other thing is standardization. So again, we are looking at how we can do that through the JCP and expect to see some JSRs filed fairly soon so that we can actually have future directions of JavaFX defined through the JCP. We can have expert groups. We can have people other than Oracle involved in the, the development of that. So let's have a quick look at JavaFX code. Now, for those of you who've done some JavaFX in the past, JavaFX 1, this is an example of what you might see. So what we have is the idea of a stage. So we've got a stage where we want to present our user interface to the user. And on the stage, we're going to have a scene. So the scene contains all the components of the graphical interface. And so what we've got here is that we've got content, which is um, an array of objects, if you like. And in that, we've got one object called a circle. And the circle has certain properties associated with it. In this case, we've got the center point of the uh, circle, which is 50 and 50 in the x and the y axis. And we've got a radius of 50. And the color that we want to fill that circle with is red. So we end up with a red circle. Very nice. Simple code, straightforward. If we compare that to JavaFX 2, now we're using pure Java code. So it's much more familiar to us. We have a class, JavaFX test. In this case, it extends application, which is part of the JavaFX classes. That gives us the lifecycle management, the ability to do the necessary windowing stuff and so on. And we've got our public static void main entry point. And all we have to do there is call the launch method. In fact, we don't even need launcher there because it's extending. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we just launch. Um, we launch the, uh, the application and off we go. That will take us into the start method and we will get a reference to a stage which is where we're going to add the components to our, our user interface. 
So we get a reference to a stage from the JavaFX system, and then what we're going to do is create a new group. We'll set the scene to be that root and how big it's going to be, which is 100 by 100. And then we simply say, okay, set the scene to be the scene. And now we create a circle as an object. The parameters we pass to the constructor will be the same ones we saw before. So we've got the X and the Y position at the center. We've got the radius and we've got the color. And then we just add that to the children of the, the root and we set it to be visible by setting it to be true, and we get a red circle. So it's, it's a little bit more code than we had before, but most of it's because we've got the boilerplate code from our, our Java application. If we do the same thing using FXML, what we have is a very simple piece of XML code here, which says that we want a border pane, which is just the layout manager. It's going to be centered, so you put the circle in the center of the border pane, and then same thing, radius, center X, center Y, and a color. We get a red circle. But rather than actually specifying all of the necessary code within the class itself, what we do is we load the FXML from that file. So what we do is we come down here and we say, use the FXML loader class, load from <coughs> our resource, example.fxml, and use a bundle to get the information about that. And then we simply set the scene and we get a red circle. So all of that's like three different, sort of moving through the different ways that you can actually create JavaFX code. So we don't use the scripting language anymore, but really you've got a choice of either doing it all by hand in your code, or you can load an FXML file to do the hard work for you. One of the other things we do a lot in JavaFX is we use what we call a fluent API, which is really just a, a continuous chain of method calls to simplify a lot of the hard work. Because if you think about something like a circle uh, or other components you might use, they have lots of different properties. And so trying to create a constructor for each possible combination of properties that somebody might want to use gets quite unwieldy. And so there's, there's defaults for all of the values that you have. So in this case, what we want to be able to do is to have some way of generating a circle we only need to specify the, the things that you're interested in, which are not going to be the default value. So here we can use the circle builder class, which will generate a circle by doing, first thing you have to call create, to create a reference as a static method. And then you say, okay, set the center X to be 50, center Y to be 50, radius to be 50, fill the color to be red, and then build, which will actually generate you a reference to a circle object. All of the intermediate method calls will return a reference to another circle builder so that you can continue to chain together the method calls. But by doing this, it actually simplifies a lot of the code and makes it uh, a lot easier to see what's going on. So one of the key things about JarFX is the way that we do things differently to Swing and AWT. So if you think about Swing, we use a container component hierarchy the components that we're putting on the screen. So you have your panel, you have your window, you have your frame, and then you use a layout manager to say, here's where I want the individual components to go. So you can use border layout, you can use flow layout, you can use grid layout. If you're really clever, you can use grid bag layout. <laughs> but that gives you a fairly kind of constricted way of doing things. So what we do in JavaFX is to move away from the container component hierarchy to using the idea of a scene graph. And this is very familiar for people who've done any sort of 3D programming. Because what it effectively is, is a graph of components where you can group things together. Its technical term is a directed acyclic graph. And what that means is that you can have parent nodes and child nodes. Child nodes are the actual things that get displayed. The parent nodes are the grouping of those nodes together. And each child can only have one parent. So you can't take, let's say, a button and add it to one part of the scene and then say, oh, okay, I want to use the same button here, so I'll add it to another part of the scene. So you can only have one parent for that particular button. So we end up with a situation where we can build a graph of objects like this. And one of the nice things about that is by grouping things together, it allows us to treat groups of objects as if they or groups of nodes as if they were a single node. 
If you want to apply an effect like a, um, a blur, or if you want to do a transformation like a rotation, rather than having to go through and say, okay, well, all these nodes make up this part of the group, I have to do the application of that effect to each of those nodes, you simply apply the effect to the, the highest group node, and it will automatically apply it to all of the nodes in that part of the scene graph. I'll show you an example of that later on. So this really is, is one of the most important things about Java effects. Everything is a node. We'll come back to that, especially when I show you some, some demos later on. Um, media is very important for these types of applications. <laughs> ability to have video, the ability to have audio in your application. And certainly, if you've ever tried doing video within Java applications before Java FX, it's never been a particularly nice thing to do. We had the Java Media Framework, there have been some open source frameworks like FMJ, but it's never been an easy thing to actually include video playback into Java. So what we've done is to say, okay, all modern platforms now support video playback. Why make life hard for ourselves? If you're using a Mac, let's use QuickTime. If you're using Windows, let's use Windows Media Player. If you're using Linux, use GStreamer, because they're all there. We can just use them. So that's what we did. So we have the ability to use the codecs that are available in the relevant platform. We also have a, if you really want to, we actually have a cross-platform codec that you can use. So we do software uh, decoding of the, the video stream. That allows us to do some clever things because we can then take that codec and by using the Prism graphics engine for rendering, we can do things like alpha channel support. So we can apply translucency to video. We can do uh, rotations, we can do all sorts of interesting things like that. And because of the way it's designed, it's very lightweight. So we're not having to really thrash the processor to get this kind of effect working. We can support full screen, uh, full screen video, so you can have like without a box around it, it all works quite nicely. And the other thing is the idea of low latency audio. And what that means is that if you have something like a button that you want a user to click on, you may want to have a sound effect associated with the user actually clicking that button. What you don't really want is to have, find that your audio comes considerably later than when the user actually clicks on that button. So you can say, okay, that, that particular audio needs to be low latency, so it gets a higher priority in terms of what's happening in Java FX. Um, yeah, so from a, a programming point of view, um, we support the idea of visual, audio, media, um, all of that's a bit sort of built in. But from the programming side of things, there's really three classes that you need to worry about. One is the idea of a media object, which represents the source of the media that you're actually going to be playing back. So that's your QuickTime file or your MP3 file or whatever. And that really deals with the decoding, making the, the source available. Then you have a, a media player class, which takes a media object and applies the ability to pause, play, fast forward, rewind. So it's really applying the controls to the video stream represented by the media. And then in order to have that represented in your scene, you need to create a node for it to go in the scene graph. So you have the media view, which is a node, and that can take a media player to render media onto the screen. So what we can actually do is, we, if we need to, we can actually have multiple media streams. You can have uh, you know, a number of videos playing at the same time, and it all works very nicely. Another thing that uh, we've included and done a lot of work on is the idea of a table, because a lot of applications want to represent data in a tabular form. So we're not sort of saying this is only for media-based applications or, or things like that. What we're really looking at is providing all of the support that people need for all types of applications. So tables are very important, and what we've done there is to think, okay, what are the features that people need? You've got the idea of resizable columns, you've got the idea of um, columns can be dragged from one place to another, you've got the idea that you can group together columns, and then you can also move groups of columns. So all of those like, very standard features you'd expect are available. Very much based on the model view controller pattern. So the, the table itself is your view. You've then got the model which represents your data and the controller which interfaces the two together. And we've 
In terms of efficiency, we realize that often people have a lot of data to display in a particular table. But tables don't tend to be very big on the screen. So let's say you've got 10,000 rows of data and your table only has 20 rows on it. Well, you don't want data in order to put them 20 rows on the screen. So we do lazy loading where it basically says, OK, read in the first 20 rows so we can render that on the screen. Read in the next 20 rows so we, you know, as the user scrolls up, they're available. But we don't have to read in all 10,000 rows in order to get stuff on the screen. So it's lazy loading gives us much better efficiency in terms of the table itself. HTML content, I mentioned the idea of having a, a web component and having that based on the WebKit rendering engine. So this has a class called the Web Engine, which allows us to say, okay, here is a web page that we want to render or some source of HTML that we want to put onto the screen. And that will pretty much handle everything that you would expect from some sort of browser support. So you can do page forward, you can do page back, you can do submitting forms, you can do post, you can do get, you can do uh, all of those types of things. But you can even go further than that. So you can actually get access to the document object model of the page. You can do some manipulation of that. You can get access to JavaScript if there's JavaScript involved. You can inject JavaScript into the page as well. So you can really do some quite complex things in terms of the way that the page is being used. It's not just a sort of static, here's some HTML, I'll throw it up on the screen, and that's the end of it. Um, so in terms of actually rendering stuff, that's the, the well, uh, reading in stuff, that's the web engine. And then to get it onto the screen, you need a node, so that's a web view. What that will do is actually figure out how to get all the, the information on the screen. And in the same way that all of the nodes in the scene graph can be manipulated, you can do the same thing with the web page. So here what I've done is I've said, OK, let's take a web page, let's uh, rotate it, do a shear transformation, add a drop shadow, and create a very usable web component. So some of the limitations on that, there are a couple of limitations. We don't support plugin support plugins on there. So if you had a web page that had flash on it, you wouldn't actually be able to see the flash running within the web page being rendered by JavaFX. Um, similarly, if you uh, we do support HTML5, but if you go to one of these sites that looks at how well your browser supports HTML5, we're going to score a bit lower. Even though we're using WebKit underneath and we are using you know pretty much the most up-to-date version we will score a bit lower than other people. And the reason for that is actually the security model of Java. So HTML5 allows you to do things like access local files. And um, we won't let you do that because the sandbox will prevent you from accessing local files unless you've got a um, signed application. So there are situations where it won't work. Um, and that way, we will score a little bit less. But on the whole, it uh, gives you a full featured HTML5 way of rendering data. Charts is another nice thing. So this is something that really does uh, give you a difference between Swing and JavaFX. Because Swing had tables in it, so that's great. It had you know, um, the idea of a tree diagram, things like that. But there was never any way to actually represent graphs of data. So all we do now is we provide you with a standard set of charts which give you things like area charts, bar charts, pie charts, line charts, scatter charts, and so on. And these can be extended as well. So if you want to add new things to that, if you want to create a different type of graph, um, then these are all extendable. And these have got some nice little features because um, they include automatic animations. And what that means is that if you've got a, let's say, a line chart where you've got three points on it, and you suddenly want to add a new point to the chart, Rather than suddenly just jumping so it's got the new display, it'll do a nice smooth animation to add that point into the chart. Um, all, of the, all of the nodes and controls within JarFX can be styled with CSS. I was talking to somebody earlier on, this well, this question came up about CSS and how well it's supported. But um, effectively, what that allows you to do is use style sheets so that you can change the look and feel of your application without having to recompile it. So you have external style sheet, you can use CSS, you can add different features and change the look and feel of your application. And I'll show you an example of that later on. 
So here I've just got a rectangle, and I'm saying, okay, the fill color is going to be yellow, the color of the line around the outside is green, got a particular width of the line around the outside, you can do some, um, create a different look for the, the dashes around the outside, and various things like that. So it allows you to control a lot of the features of what you see simply by changing the style sheet. Um, effects, different things that you'd expect. So we've got the idea of a Gaussian blur, if you want to blur things. Uh, shadow effects, reflection, so you can do the typical sort of iTunes look and feel, um, sepia tone, all the kind of things that you'd expect in terms of general effects. Similarly, transformations. So if you want to move objects around the screen or change the way they're actually uh, positioned, you can do that. So what I've got here is just a, a rectangle with some curved corners. Um, I haven't paid Apple the necessary licensing fee to use curved corners on that rectangle, but um, that's okay. Um, then we can rotate the thing by 45 degrees. It's nice that they can actually, they've used degrees rather than radians, because I don't know about you, but my mind works a lot better in degrees than it does in radians. Uh, similarly, you can scale in both the X and the Y axis, so you can change the size of it. You can also do a shear transformation, and if you want to do a translation, i.e. move the uh, position of something, you can do that pretty easily as well. If you want to combine these, you can either do it by combining the method calls, or you can explicitly define an affine transformation, which is a matrix which will allow you to combine the different things together. Binding. Now, this is probably one of the most powerful features in JavaFX from a, a programming point of view, because what it allows you to do is to set up a dependency between some property of something in your display and some value that you're going to be changing for some reason. Now that could be because you're reading data from a source, it could be because somebody's moving a mouse, uh, whatever it is, doesn't matter. But it's a dependency between a property of something and a value that's likely to change. Now, there's two ways of doing this. You can either do it using a high-level API, or you can do it using a low-level API. High-level API makes life simple. So you simply say, okay, there are some very common situations where I want things to happen. And so we'll use a simple API to implement that. If the high-level API doesn't address all of your needs, then there's a low-level API that's a bit more complicated, requires a bit more code, but gives you complete flexibility. So you can delve down and you can actually say, okay, I really need to make this do some, some specific things, and you can use the API to do that. So for binding to work, we rely on properties. So we actually define a set of property classes within JavaFX. So we call them properties, but we also have specific classes for that. So there are concrete types for all of the primitives. So you've got Boolean, you've got int, you've got float, and so on. And then there is one for string and one for object. And then once you've got a property, you can simply say, I want to bind or unbind this property to something else. And similarly, you can do a bidirectional bind. So if you've got two properties and you want them to be affected by changing to either, then you can bind in both ways. And you can find out if you are actually bound to something as well. So here's a simple example of, of how I might use that. So what I want to be able to do is have a line drawn on the screen where one end of the line is fixed and the other end of the line moves based on, let's say, where my mouse pointer is. To do that, I create two simple double properties to represent the end of the line. It's an X and a Y property. And then I create my line. I set the one end of the line to be fixed at position 200, 200. And then what I have to do is I have to retrieve the property of that line, which gives me the start X and the start Y properties. So by calling start X property, that will return me the property associated with that point of the line. And then I can call bind on that to bind my property to that. Which means that whenever I change top x property's value, it will change the position of the end of that line. And that will automatically be updated on the screen. I don't have to call repaint. I don't have to redraw anything. Simply by doing the binding, JavaFX will take care of all of that for me. What this leads into is the idea of using timelines for animations. So animations are not just about cartoon type animations, they're about anything that changes over time. And the way we do this is through the use of a timeline, 
which has a number of key frames, which in themselves have key values associated with them. So what a key frame says is that there is a particular point in time where I want some value to be true. And then the values are represented by the key values. So here what I've got is an example where I'm saying that I want a timeline to be five seconds long. So I want something to change over five seconds. I define one keyframe at zero seconds, so when the timeline starts, I define one keyframe at five seconds, which is where the end of the timeline is. Within that, I have one key value for each of those keyframes, which is to simply say that the radius property is going to change from 30 initially at zero seconds to 300 at five seconds. When I run that timeline, the JarFX system will change the value of the radius property from 30 to 300 over five seconds. It will do it in a linear form. You can also do different types of interpolation, but by default it does it in a linear way. That way, if I've got a circle and I bind the radius property of that circle to the radius property I've got here, when the timeline changes the value of that property from 30 to 300, what I'm going to see is my radius and my circle, my circle grow from 30 to 300 over five seconds. So it makes it very easy to have effects applied to different parts of your user interface. To make life even easier, we also provide you with a set of standard transitions, which are really like prepackaged timelines. So you've got things like a, a fade transition, if you want to have something on your display fade out. Let's say you move your mouse away from a button, you want to make it less visible, so you can fade that button out. You can do path transitions where you can move something along a line on the screen. You can do rotation transitions, scale transitions, translate transitions. What you can also do is group these things together. So you can have them either happen in parallel, so if you want a button to fade and grow at the same time, you can do that. You can also have them happen sequentially. So if you want your button to fade and then grow, you can do that. And you can combine not just transitions, but also timelines, because they share a common superclass. So you can mix the two together. You get a lot of control over what you actually have happen. Um, swing and SWT interoperability, this is something that's quite important. And currently what we do is we have interoperability where you can take a Swing application and you can embed a JavaFX component into that. So you can wrap your JavaFX scene to make it appear to be a Swing <coughs> component. And then you can simply insert it using your layout manager. We've had a lot of requests for the idea going the other way, where you can take a swing component and embed it into a JarFX application. And so that's one of the things that will be happening later, but we don't have that quite yet. Because the idea that we really want is to have help people to migrate from a swing application to a JarFX application by saying, okay, take your existing swing application, gradually replace parts of it with JarFX components, and then when you've done that, simply change the whole thing to a JavaFX application. So you're not having to do a, a massive rewrite of your code. Same thing with SWT applications, there's a way of um, having backwards compatibility there. Um, Java tools and uh, tooling, so basically NetBeans, we've got, um, it's Java code, so it doesn't need a lot of special treatment. But we do have some project types that automatically import the necessary jar file and things like that. There's debugging support and some wizards and so on, things like that. Also got support in Eclipse, there's a plugin for that, uh, IntelliJ and, and uh, the usual things. The scene builder, already mentioned this, this is the idea where you can say, okay, I want to drag and drop the, the components that I want, lay them out the way that I want them to be, and then have them generate an FXML file automatically. So design for user interface designers, graphical designers, people who aren't going to be doing coding. From a deployment perspective, like I say, there's Java underneath, so it's either a standalone application, you can do it as an applet, and you can do it as a web start through a browser as well. What we've now also done is introduce the JarFX Packager from Java SE 7 Update 6. What this allows you to do is to generate an executable bundle which bundles not just your application and your JAR file, but also the JAR runtime and the JVM runtime. 
So you can have the whole thing in a single package. That way you avoid all the problems of, if you want to deploy this, making sure that the uh, person who is going to deploy this has the right version of the Java runtime environment and so on. In fact, somebody has, uh, at Oracle has now successfully put um, one of our sample applications into the Mac App Store. So you can actually download one of the JavaFX applications from the Mac App Store, and that will include the, the Java runtime as well as the application itself. So it doesn't break any of the licensing terms of Apple, and uh, it's all um, available to use. So we can generate MSI files, we can generate EXE files, DMG files, RPM files, whichever is most appropriate for the platform you want to deploy to. Um, we're also looking at the idea of up auto updates. So if you want to uh, update the application, we can do that as well. A couple of things about distribution and support. Um, until recently, we did have an issue where we didn't. I mean, there were some licensing things about actually redistributing the JarFX runtime, which is the, the jar file that you need. That's all been sorted out now, so um, you don't need to worry about that. You can simply distribute the jar file with your application, and you're free to do that. Similarly, if you want to pay us money, we're always happy for you to do that. And so we do have commercial support as an offering. That's about as close as I get to sales. Um, and so, yes, you can get support through the, the normal channels if you, um, that you have for Java SE support as well. Future directions I've already kind of talked about. So tighter integration with Java SE, um, other migration paths for different UIs and so on, um, better tooling, better web services support, Modern devices, so you know, can we go down the route of supporting things like the iPad, supporting um, Android tablets, and so on? We've demonstrated this. Technically, there's no problem. Uh, even from a licensing point of view, there's no problem because we can bundle the JVM with the application. At the moment, we don't. We're not getting enough interest commercially to make it worth our while actually putting all the engineering effort into that. So if you are interested in deploying JarFX onto iOS or onto Android, uh, please uh, either send me an email or um, go to the JarFX website and express your interest because that's the, the way that we're going to change that. So JarFX basically is a cross-platform uh, way of delivering new kinds of UIs. Um, very much the idea of a JarFX, a Java API um, you've got the Java platform underneath, you can use all of the existing libraries you've got. You can use CSS to skin things, you can use hardware acceleration, WebKit, um, so on and so forth. So what I really want to do is get onto the demo, so I'm going to actually show you this in action. There's a couple of places to go for more information. Um, I will make the slides available so um, you can get the slides from the website and so you'll be able to get this. Right, so let's just show you a couple of demos, because it's all, all well and good talking about this stuff. Much better if we actually show you this in action. So, first one I want to show you is one of our sample applications that we, we provide. And this is called I don't know that word. This is called Ensemble, and it's basically a, a very large set of sample applications that will show you how to get started with JavaFX. Because I don't know about you, but when I first started learning to program, I learned by typing in other people's programs and then starting to modify them. So this is the same idea. And so you've got all sorts of different things like, okay, for, let's see, uh, sort of timeline events. Um, then there's just a simple example there of something happening. But what's really nice is you can say, okay, well, let me look at the source code for that. And so there's, there's the source code. And you can see that that's what it does. And then you can say, okay, well, you can either copy that, so you want to make it available in a different ID, or you can save it as a NetBeans project. So I'll just save it as a NetBeans project, and you can open it up. Um, and then, obviously, you've got, uh, let's see, other animations. That's a sequential transition where different things are happening. Pause transition. Pause transition. Pause transition. That's it. Yeah, so that's just a path transition, just shows, you know, the block moving on a um, thing. And there we go. Again, see the source code. Um, let's see, there's some other ones. This is just using, uh, in fact, that one's using one that we introduced recently, which is the idea of Canvas. So in the same way you've got HTML5 Canvas, so you can basically do pixel addressing. That's the same, the same thing, you can do that now. 
So you can minimize stuff like that. Um, Yeah, so that sort of pseudo 3D thing there using perspective transforms. Um, nice little xylophone there. Um, yeah, um, usual sort of display shot off kind of thing. Right, so like I say, that, that's really good because it gives you lots of, um, lots of sample applications. Then just to show you a few things that, um, right, so this is the idea of using style sheets. So basically what I've got here is just uh, a simple login screen where I've got you know, some text, I've got uh, user field, password field, and a button. But what I can do is I can restyle that by changing the style sheet associated with it. So if I change it to that one, I get suddenly you know, different font, different color around the box. The button's got different curves on it. I can change it to a different one there. And we see slightly different look again with that. And that's just by changing the style sheet. Um, which is just you know, a simple idea there. Um, actually, yeah, let's start with this one. Right, so this was another one that, uh, this was one I worked on recently. This, this shows the idea of binding. So what I've got here is like a simple mesh. And then what I've done is I've used a physics engine underneath, with just a Java physics engine. And by binding the position of all the points in my mesh to the values generated by the physics engine, what I can do is I can just hit the button and then have gravity affect the uh, the, the nodes in the, the mesh, and then I can do things like I can pull that and I can make it sort of move around like that. So that, that's kind of, you know, that's interesting. But then I thought, okay, let, let's try and make that a little bit more interesting. So what I thought is, okay, so here's a, here's a picture on the right-hand side, and I've got a rectangle on the left-hand side. And again, what I'm doing is using binding. So if I move the position of one of these points, it actually changes the... Uh, the binding to a perspective transformation that's being applied to the picture on the right. So what I thought is, okay, let's take that picture and we'll chop it up into lots of small pieces, map that onto the mesh that I've got in my um, physics application, and then what we'll do is we'll run that. So now I've got the same picture that I had before, but this time if I overlay the lines, what I've done is chop it up into all the different pieces of the picture and then apply a, a perspective transformation to each one of those uh, pieces of the picture. So as the position of the, the points in the mesh move, the points in the picture will move. Um, and actually, I'm just going to show you one thing before I do that. Yeah. So going back to this one. So th this is fine because you can see they've got a nice perspective transform there, and that all works very well. However, you do get a little bit of a problem. If, if you go re-entrant on this point, Suddenly it flips over. So that's just the way a perspective transform works. There's nothing wrong with that. That is the way a perspective transform works. So just bear that in mind when I show you the next demo. So what I'll do now is I'll start that running, and then what it's going to do is it's just going to apply the, the same effect. So the, the fact you get this sort of kind of glitching sort of look on the side, that's because of the way the perspective transform works. What I really need to do is go back and actually figure out how do I take uh, an image and run using a perspective transform using a morph from uh, the Java Advanced Imaging API. Um, but I haven't quite got around to that yet, so you can do things like that. But that, that just shows you, because it's all kind of broken up into the individual elements of the picture. But, so there's a lot of processing going on there, but it doesn't uh, overload the processor. Um, right, so let's just a couple more. Um, this is just a very simple demo that I did um, a long time ago. I wrote this in JavaFX1 initially. And I thought, okay, let's, let's turn it into JavaFX2. So this is just a clock which is using a continuous timeline to update the clock to represent you know, the day, the hours, the month, and so on. And so that's just, you know, that's a nice little application. But, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it, it does that, because I, I will be honest and say that the reason it does that is because I'm actually using an early build of JDK 7 on here. And the reason I'm doing that is because I still have Snow Leopard on here. And at the moment, we are, well, in fact, we only support Lion or Later for the JDK install. So I'm using an early build, which does have a couple of glitches in it. Um, right, so the important thing about that particular demonstration is to know that that was a whole application. Okay? But remember that everything in JavaFX is a node. So if 
Everything in JavaFX is a node. That whole application is a node. Just bear that in mind. So now if I run this. This was another application that I wrote in JavaFX 1, which was the idea of a book. And what I did here was I saw somebody written something similar in Flash. And I thought that would be really interesting to try and rewrite that in JavaFX. So what we can do is we can actually lift the cover of the book and see what's inside. And if I let go, it just drops the new cover of the book back. And that's basically using a combination of perspective transformation, shear transformation, um, and scaling, and so on. So if I open the book, um, obviously we can see what's inside the book. And then, because the page is inside a paper rather than the hardcover, if I, if I drag the corner of the page, it starts folding the page over. And we'll be able to see what's on the other side of the page. But of course, like I said, this is using groups and transformations and everything, so you can see how the scene graph works. But since everything in JavaFX is a node, I can simply put my whole application onto the page of the, um, the book so that we can see that. Um, and then I can turn the page over again. Oh, that's not looking too good. And that appears to have temporarily not been working. <laughs> okay, let's just try running that again. I tell you, th this is my life. Demos that like, work perfectly outside and then you try and do them in front of an audience. Okay, let's just try that one, one more time. Go here. Good, okay. So, <laughs> then you can put like, controls in there, so you can put a name in there, you can, do something, you can submit that, have that do something interesting. Um, and then, like I say, you can also use media. So we've got some media running there, and so that's just running in there, so I can do things like I can click that media, that's all like, very easy to do. Um, I can clip it and I can also spin it. Um, again, all of the effects work, so I can change the translucency as well if I wanted to, things like that. I've got a few more ideas for things to do with this, but um, I haven't actually got to the next page of the book yet. Um, but hopefully that's given you some ideas about what you can do with Java effects and uh, the ideas behind Java effects. So thank you very much. What you, would you recommend as a strategy to, for migrating from a Swin application to Java FX? Right, so in, in terms of migration strategy, what we're trying to do is to say to people, okay, if you've got a big complicated Swin application, Rather than having to rewrite the whole thing in JavaFX and do it as a single jump, what we suggest is that you, you take different parts of your display, rewrite those in JavaFX, and because you can then make those look like a, a swing component, you can then make, uh, you can integrate that into your swing application. So I could use uh, JavaFX inside my swing application? Yes, and then there's bi-directional um, processing of events, so you can take events from the swing um, component and pass them to the JavaFX components, and similarly you can take events from the JavaFX component and pass it back to Swing. So all that works quite simply. Right, sounds good. Um, yeah, that's, that's coming, because I know that some people have said they really want to embed Swing, app, swing components into JavaFX. Um, on the whole, we don't recommend that because, um, you know, we, we supply a comprehensive set of controls, so all the buttons and text fields and so on. But there are definitely some people who've got very complex library type functions which are written in Swing and they want to be able to embed them into a, a JavaFX component. So we are working on that and it will be available soon. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay, so yeah, so the DOM inspector will allow you to, to change on the fly. But I mean, you can pretty much do that anyway with JavaFX. So, what, what, can, what can you not change? Uh, like CSS, I can not change from live code. In that example, I just simply replaced the style sheet associated with it, so I did it on the fly. Oh. 
Okay, but are there any tools, right? Well, the, I mean, not tools specifically, but I mean, within the application code, there's just one method. So I have to write my own? Uh, yes, yes. At that level, yes, if you wanted to change CSS, you would need a uh, tool to do that. Um, it may be integrated into the um, the uh, scene builder. So we, we may use some more things around CSS with that. So yeah, we, we might see some stuff there. My question is, uh, in uh, JavaFX1, there was a connection with uh, SVG graphics and uh, the JavaFX, actually. There was a plugin for Photoshop, I think, uh, with right. which you can create SVG graphics. What's now? Um, yeah, so that, that was the project where we were able to export from Photoshop into a format that was readable by JavaFX1. Um, we still can support scalable vector graphics, but it's not in a proprietary format. So we can just use an export from uh, Photoshop um, in a normal format. We don't have to have a special plugin for that. So it will work, yeah. Do you plan uh, to develop a new component uh, like tree table? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, that's one of the things that we're always looking at is what, uh, what other components we need. There's an interesting open source project called JFX, which uh, they've developed um, quite a nice set of uh, components or controllers as well. So there are people developing third party controllers. So we will continue to develop more, but there will also be third party ones being developed as well. Uh, how much does it cost the user to use JavaFX in that browser? I mean, uh, do you plan to provide some kind of uh, built in plugin in? Modern browsers or something like this. Okay, so so the cost is nothing. So it's free. Uh, no, I mean how useful it would it can can it be? Right. Okay. So the issue really comes down to the plugin. Um, we are trying to move away from the plugin. That that's our kind of stated direction. So we're looking at ways that you can get around that, um, so that you can still run Java applications from within the web browser, um, because. This is just like the whole minefield of, of just supporting the plugin and making the plugin work and, and all those things. So we're definitely looking at um, ways that we can simplify that whole process so that you can use JavaFX directly from a, a web page. Um, but it's, it's not quite there yet, in the field, I, what I have to say. Uh, yes, I suppose, yeah, yeah. Please the last questions. Aha, uh -huh, right, good question. So you want to use a webcam from JavaFX. Um, it's not something that we support right now. Um, it's in the plans for a future release. So it's definitely something that's in the plans for the next release. I'm not quite sure how, how comprehensive the support will be, but yes. Um, I know it's something I'd really like to have access to as well. So uh, hopefully that will be sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you, Simon. Thank you.